on. Yeah, I'm trying. Dan is going to make the official introduction <laughs> to the grass lab. Oh, Oh, okay, it's all queued up, so maybe I just do the, uh, the thing on the thing. Hi, my name's Dan Kojic. I'm not the, uh, Dan Lee. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to make it, you want to be named Dan. No, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not Dan. Uh, I'm the, uh, I've been Dan coach by Professor Dan, who's the director of the Grass Club, who uh, uh, gives the... Uh, uh, welcome and introduction on, uh, on his behalf. So, uh, 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 sorry for the uh, dislocation. Uh, thanks for Jumbo and welcome uh, today. Um, the uh, the grass flap is a uh, uh, very very uh, successful and uh, world renowned uh, institution of uh, fundamental knowledge and uh, technology spin out in robotics. Uh, starting to grow again, uh, we have now sixteen faculty in uh, various departments throughout the university. We have uh, at least 90 PhD students. This number, of course, uh, changes from, uh, from year to year and semester to semester, but we have uh, at least 90 uh, doctoral students and uh, numerous postdocs. We should count the postdocs. We have quite a number of postdocs these days and, uh, um, again, more than 120 master's students uh, in robotics um, and many, many undergraduates. Uh, of course, it's, it's hard to count them. Uh, because uh, uh, they have um, uh, many, many different affiliations. Uh, roughly $14 million per annum and many, many uh, industrial government partnerships uh, growing, changing, uh, expanding all the time. Um, the first and most important business, I think, of the morning is to introduce our... Uh, uh, thanks to uh, Gabby for presenting, for producing the slides. Thank you, Gabby. Uh, I'd like to introduce our, our uh, the, the, uh, the our, 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 our treasured uh, jewels uh, uh, who are just joining us. Uh, I don't know, is Ani here? Is Ani, are you here? There you are. Say so. Ani Shea is uh, here. Oh, you did that. Oh, okay. So, sorry. I, uh, Michael's here and Cynthia's here. So, uh, that's really the biggest news that I would say we have this year, which is we have uh, uh, sterling, uh, stunning new uh, colleagues. Um, we have the wonderful facilities at, uh, the, the, there's the GRASP uh, installation at Levine, uh, and we have this uh, new uh, 
a facility down at Perch. I urge you all to come down and uh, see us at Perch if you, if you haven't seen us yet. Uh, the facilities, in some sense, speak for themselves. Just come on down. Uh, and Levine, of course, is uh, a newly refurbished. Gabby and, uh, and uh, uh, Charity Payne, our uh, associate director, have been working all summer to refurbish the, uh, the lab. I'm quickly going through to give you some sense of the range of faculty interest. This is a slide from Dan Lee that gives some very general suggestion of his uh, many, many, many different interests in uh, the way in which perception and action c come together in uh, animals and machines. Uh, you know, if you, if, you, if, you, if you talk to the folks in my group, we do a lot of leggy things. We do other things too, but uh, I guess we're, we're known locally for our, for our, our leggy things. Uh, uh, Dan's been leading, Dan Lee has been leading successful soccer ventures uh, down at the soccer uh, leagues with t tiny teams of undergraduates that always uh, win these, not always, but almost always win these contests against uh, huge odds with uh, teams that with paid, you know, 30 paid postdocs uh, from other uh, uh, teams. So it's, it's really a great thing. If you're an undergraduate, you want to get involved in that. Dan has also uh, been one of our foremost uh, uh, participants in the uh, uh, success of DARPA robotics challenges that we've seen uh, from uh, year to year. So um, those are, uh, those are, that's a good bet um, if you're interested in, uh, Dan, Dan has a lot of participation in those. Uh, Vijay Kumar is of course internationally renowned at his group for the uh, pioneering work they've been doing on uh, robot um, uh, control and uh, planning in general, but uh, most recently the work in quad rotors has uh, won huge uh, acclaim and attention. Uh, here's work, I guess, from John, but I guess this is from your lab, and we're using it as a stand in for the amazing computer vision work that's going on, John Bershut and uh, Costas. I'm not sure if Costas is here, uh, uh, are leading our, our, our the, the, you know, the renowned work and exciting work in computer vision. Mark is here. Mark Yim is, uh, has a, again, a, you know, he was, he is the pioneer of modular robotics, uh, well, the idea of Mark Pizzo, and he hasn't stopped working on modular robotics. Of course, he does other things too. Go see him if you uh, want to hear more. Uh, Professor Sung uh, joins us with origami, uh, and I didn't uh, manage to uh, integrate anybody else's uh, slides because of my uh, slovenly habits, I'm sorry. Uh, we have really, really, really uh, strong, vibrant uh, outreach activities going on, uh, and you'll hear a little bit about these at the end from uh, Dan Wood, who's been uh, leading us for a couple of years now. Uh, uh, with great, with great uh, outcome and great uh, success, um, you know. So, of course, the richest part of our endowment and the most important component of the of the, uh, of the enterprise is the, uh, is the CU, is the CU, is the uh, undergraduate, the master's students, the doctoral students, the postdocs. Uh, you know, that's that's the real treasure. students and the postdocs. Okay, so um, that gives you some sense of, of uh, what's happening. I, it falls to me to be the, the master of ceremonies, I think, so I'm going to be the one with the timer. Uh, we have 12 people. I'll give uh, four minutes, and then the crickets will chirp, and uh, uh, then we'll move on to the next person. But uh, we're uh, delighted that, uh, to see such a, a large and um, smiling group. And uh, come, come visit our labs, or if we're already in the labs, come visit other people's labs as well. Great. Okay, our first speaker of the morning is uh, going to be a presentation by James Stokes on behalf of Professor uh, Eric Eaton. Okay. So, it seems like we can't see anything on my screen, which is a good start. Um, does anybody know how this works? Uh, one? Here. Okay. Slideshow. How do we get into slideshow mode? View. 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 Yeah. Slideshow. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Okay, so, yeah. As we alluded to already, I'm not last night. So um, let me just warm up with a motivating example. So imagine you've got some robot and a little bit of a task here. I don't know, identifying various things in some environments. Could be a university up here. And 
then perhaps we have some other robot which is performing a different but related set of functions. It could be something else like that. And you can see that there's some kind of task relatedness here already. And then you can, of course, iterate this process over and over. Imagine the robot isn't just solving one task, but it's solving a multitude of tasks, each of which is sampled from a probability distribution over the task set. So the kind of high-level overview of this research is to come up with algorithms that can take advantage of the fact that there's task relatedness, or more precisely, that these tasks are sampled from a probability distribution. OK. So when we use the word lifelong learning, we're typically referring to the fact that we have some agent that's continually expanding upon some chunk of knowledge so as to leverage its prior experience and accelerate on new tasks. OK, so uh, by the way, I have no idea how the time is going to just shut out. about two minutes and 30 seconds. Totally improvised. <laughs> so uh, overall goals are that these. So basically, let's go through them. One, we have a bunch of knowledge, so we want to be able to accelerate on the new task. That's point one. We want to learn continually with experience. It's interesting to contrast this with batch multitask learning, which is the paradigm in which you have data sets from all tasks available at training time. So that's not what we're interested in here. We're interested in a robot which is probably receiving experience online in a stream now, which means that we need to be able to learn continually with our experience. On top of that, we got to have versatility over you know, multiple tasks. So let's say I'm become expert performance with task B. I don't want to sacrifice all my performance on one and two on this one, right? And then uh, we want to allow for the possibility of human guidance as well. OK, so how do we accomplish these goals? One way of accomplishing these goals is by trying to share knowledge across tasks and possibly uh, amongst agents. So what is Ella? Ella is a... Um, yeah, let me go back to the uh, batch multitask comparison. So, as I mentioned, if we think about each of our tasks as a machine learning problem with some training data, batch multitask would correspond to the case that we have all data at test time. Ella, on the other hand, you can think of as a kind of online multitask learning. So, in other words, we only see data from the current task, and yet we have to achieve the same goal of multitask learning, which to, is to improve performance on single task learning. The way in which Ella accomplishes this is it maintains a persistent chunk of knowledge, that's that kind of blue storm you got over there, which is continually updated upon receiving each new data set from the potential task. And then by utilizing task-specific projection matrices, we can specialize to the single task and improve upon the single task of learning. So that is the, that's what uh, lifelong learning is, that's what, how Ella sort of overcomes that challenge. Uh, I should just point out there are various ways in which it has been deployed, um, some of which I'm more familiar with than others. One which is of more interest in robotics is, of course, policy gradients uh, for control, uh, where it's been applied successfully in some simple uh, robotic tasks for uh, basically the same purpose. You have multiple robots, and then you incrementally improve your knowledge. Another interesting one is the zero-shot platform running. Ah, oh, right. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks so much. I'm already out of time. <laughs> okay, our next speaker is uh, Professor Anishet. Uh, uh, yeah, I just need to get my. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> So, okay, so, uh, oh <laughs> there we go, excellent, okay, so, um, I'm on the chair, and so, in my lab, we're mostly interested in uh, robots uh, operating in flows, so another way to think about this is anything, sort of, any of the systems that operate, you know, with just bits and elements, so they're interested in being in control, uh, is, that's kind of what's in here, so, uh, one thing to, to, that I'm going to show you is that, you know, so most of us are applications in, in, in the ocean, but you guys have fun more broadly. Um, and as a lot of you know, so, you know, the ocean is our largest uh, repository for minerals as well as biodiverse resources, which really drives the climate weather pattern across the globe. So we're all aware of the recent uh, 
hurricane disasters. Uh, we know what happened with um, Deepwater Horizon back in 2010. We know the migrant crisis in the Middle Class somewhere as well as the summer. We also are very familiar with things like red tide and how that impacts the local fishing industry. Now, all of these are sort of very high impact um, you know, problems that robotics and our economy can really you know, make a big difference. And so things like cleanup, things like search and rescue, um, and also, you know, even doing uh, marine sciences and atmospheric sciences. And so the kinds of things that we are interested in, oh, wrong computer, the kinds of things we're interested in is really about building the equivalent of a dual navigator. Um, the talk and the hoping that this movie plays is, uh, so what you're seeing, oops, let me do, go back. Um, so my movie see the animation of the surface uh, currents for the entire globe. Uh, this is a the wind map uh, for, again, the global wind map. And if you go down to that um, web address there, you can actually uh, rotate the globe. It actually is showing you real-time wind uh, information. If you look at those maps, uh, what you'll see is that there's, in fact, a lot of structure. Um, and there's a lot of features that one can now leverage right, in order to uh, do this thing. A lot of people will say, you know, it's not possible for you know building thing, building a map uh, of the ocean. Um, but my argument here is, if you look at those two movies, uh, in fact, it's not true. But what you have to be careful is you have to ask the question: What are the set, uh, the right set of features, right? And so we look at things that, if you look at the water with the correct lens, and this is now where we look in the dynamic systems and the fluid dynamics uh, literature, you can see that there is in fact structure that you can exploit that helps you predict what those flow dynamics are. Um, and then if you know how to exploit that information, you can now sort of really you know, think about the ocean as this big energy reservoir that can be leveraged in doing very energy efficient deployment and navigation. And if you pick the right structures, it now also allows you to actually do very you know, prediction as to where exactly things are going to land. So this is an animation of debris being um, sort of thrown out And if you know what the right set of features to be looking for, or watermarks, uh, in sense landmarks, in those parts of water, um, then you can, in fact, do a really good job of, of actually um, not just building the map, but also now doing prediction and be able to chase after things that you're interested in, in, you know, in either monitoring or doing cleanup or those kinds of applications. So I'm just going to go through this really quickly, the kinds of things that we do. Uh, we track flow features, and this is the work um, all of this is really an excuse to have a big pool in the lab. Um, so we have a big water tank. We can throw robots in our water tank. We can run pool experiments. We can even create ocean-like features, ocean-like flows in our water tank. And so, um, so that's the kind of stuff that we do. So we're interested in using robots to be able to track these kinds of features in order to build our map. Uh, we do things like uh, information-based uh, search for uh, and then, of course, we got lots of other stuff, so come and see me afterwards. <laughs>
from negatives. So what happens if you want to go around negative weights? So what does that mean intuitively? So what, what does a weight mean? It means that two things are similar. Two nodes are similar. So the coefficient is quite clear. The greater the coefficient, the more similar they are. What does negative mean? It means they are different. So you see the result. So I was able to concoct uh, a generalization of Jumbo's method to negative weights. And actually, uh, it was a great, a very pleasant surprise. Uh, a graduate student in PTR was set up. Uh, actually came up with uh, an application of this in uh, computational linguistics. And it was while he actually published the paper uh, in a conference of uh, natural language processing this summer. So that's one thing I'm still interested in. Uh, interestingly enough, the solutions are in fact uh, projected, which means that when you solve uh, these problems, you have a discrete problem, you make it continuous, it boils down to some eigenvalue problem, but the solution Geometry of projective space. So I was very happy to realize that. Uh, another thing I've been interested about, um, so we all, we all have our, there's a good friend, SO3. Right? It's a good friend because it's a group of rotations. It's a good friend because it's compact. Like three, F, three by three matrices are orthogonal, so it's some big sphere, you know, in R9. But what if you want translations? So uh, then it's SC3. Bad. That is not a friendly world. Not compact, it's very difficult to do anything. But I've been trying to understand uh, actually BJ Kumar some years ago about this. I was interested if we can do something about that. And then there are the spaces that kind of come with these things. The Grassmannians, where are the Grassmannians? The set of linear subspaces of a certain dimension. Quite friendly. And then the affine Grassmannians, which are the affine subspaces, quite unfriendly. So I've been trying to understand that. And uh, to avoid the crickets. Okay, thank you very much, John. Okay, uh, Michelle, uh, Professor Johnson won't be here, but it's Michael, are you there? Michael Zerbara will present for uh, Professor Michelle Johnson in the medical school and in dress class. Dongles on dongles, huh? Well, that's not good. All righty. Um, hey, here we are. I'm Michael Sorapera. I'm in the rehab robotics lab. Uh, and so what we do is we build robots for therapy. Uh, and we have a couple focuses when we do that. One of them is to keep our robots low cost uh, and with an international appeal. So co crossing cultural boundaries uh, and you know, with the cost, crossing those cost boundaries. Our robots we build are designed for assessment and treatment of patients who have therapeutic needs. Uh, generally, we focus on upper limb function with that. And then also on trying to use these robots to develop an understanding of what's going on with our patients, what are the neural underlying their diseases. Uh, and then, Lately, we've been really, being really interested in how can we use robots and perception techniques to build objective measures of how patients are doing. So we focus on patients with non-traumatic brain injuries that generally is stroke and cerebral palsy uh, of all ages, from you know, a couple months old up to the very elderly. And lately, we've also been looking at how some comorbidity is working with stroke and CP uh, as far as AIDS go. So that can be really interesting. Uh, we're led by Dr. Michelle Johnson, and we have people across uh, ME, BE, uh, Robo, uh, other universities, all over the place. It's a broad group. So let's go to our projects real quick. Uh, one of them is the Panda Gym. The central thesis here is that we can use uh, perception techniques via a sensorized mat and sensorized toys and a vision system to understand at a very young age if a child is going to have a developmental disorder. And we already know that by treating children earlier, we can have better outcomes. Uh, and so that's kind of the goal here. So can we see that earlier and treat them earlier? Uh, another one of our projects is Rehab Pairs. The idea here is to build a ultra-low cost rehab gym where one or two therapists can extend their time to handling a number of patients. So you see a lot of single degree of freedom, uh, activated and unactivated systems here, a lot of gamification. Um, and you know, we've got some haptics coming back down here. This is called the haptic therapy on the bottom right. And then looking, you know, I mentioned uh, 
HIV coming in. So you can see up here, if we have somebody who's doing a lot of uh, MRIs and that sort of thing, and you can see there's a difference between people who have and don't have HIV along with the shrew. Uh, we also have the Biadler, which is designed to help people get better at doing activities of daily living, things like drinking out of a cup, using a spoon, um, that sort of stuff. When they have an affected and unaffected side, which is very common in strokes, so you'll have one arm that's still good and one arm that's bad. So if you put the good arm in to the flesh side up here, it kind of tracks where your good arm's going. Uh, you can put your right arm into the activated side and it'll help guide you and retrain you to do these bimanual tasks. We also have the bias, which is another objective measuring system, so very low cost, we can track risks and try to uh, use that to do some various measures. Uh, and then we have the flow and low flow system, which is actually what I work on. The idea here is that right now, telepresence and therapy is done with essentially a screen, maybe on a stick with a mobile robot. Uh, you lose something there that you have in an interpersonal relationship. So we think that if we put a humanoid robot on there, uh, and we have to interact with people, it can both communicate better as well as building connections, uh, and that can have good outcomes. Uh, we also have a project trying to project the things that therapists do with patients onto a Baxter robot with patients. Um, and the idea here is, you know, how do you see touch dynamics? How do you have intent get projected from therapist to patient when we do that with the robot? Uh, and so as you can see, this is all really multifaceted. We touch medicine, we touch controls, perception, um, a lot of HRI, uh, you know, some you know, brain scan, that sort of thing. So if you're interested, definitely reach out to us. Um, check us out. I've got 23 seconds, so I'll just peace out as well and not hear the crickets. <laughs> Hi, I'm Boram from Professor Daniel's group. Um, I, I was. I do duplicate. Mm -hmm. Can I extend? extend? Want to extend? It'll work. Just, right. just duplicate them. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Let's just go with the thing. Sorry. Yeah. 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 One's good. All right. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, so I'm Boram from Professor Dennis Group. Um, so our group has a wide spectrum of research areas. Um, so I will briefly introduce each research topic, and let me start from humanoid-related products. So we participated in DARPA Robotics Challenge jointly with UCLA. Uh, so this video shows the days at the final in 2015. So what our group have been working with this robot uh, covers locomotion, manipulation, grasping, whole body control, and perception, and so on. Uh, specifically, we've been working to improve efficiency of manipulation planning for high-dimensional manipulators, and working to develop a principled, um, oh, I see. I'm sorry, I think 
my my laptop has a battery issue. It's for still doing. <laughs> you want to come back at the end? Yes, yes, that would come be great. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right, come see Professor McGill. He's back in the sabbatical uh, in January. I think we're on Thursday teaching. Uh, he's an amazing guy. Uh, and if we have time, I want to come back uh, and get to him. But, uh, no. uh, all right. Um, okay, in our lineup, we have now Professor Michael Poza, our uh, a new our hire to uh, you. Uh, Michael, welcome. All right, thanks. So uh, I'm, I'm new here, so I figured I would just talk a little bit about myself. I uh, spent some time in industry after my undergrad at this company called Vecna, where we're doing some, some cool robotics and making some videos, and also some you know pretty janky video making, as you might see as this, as this video plays. I also spent uh, some time uh, at, at MIT, where I did my PhD, among other things, worked on the DARPA Robotics Challenge there. And sort of the, the big takeaway from all this was I think that contact, like robots are really interacting with the world. This is where a lot of the really fundamentally hard problems are. And one of the fundamentally exciting problems in robotics. All right, so we've seen a lot of success. The PRC also had some failures, and some of those were really directly attributed to our inability to properly address some of the challenges with contact. And just on a very high level, why is this hard? It's a hard problem because we get discontinuities in our dynamics. We have things like non-unique solutions. We have non-existence of solutions, uh, Zeno phenomena, other you know other paradoxes that can occur, and we need better theory and better algorithms to address these sort of problems. And that's really what I'm what I'm interested in. So some of the work that, I, that I've done, I'm going to continue to work on, uh, relates to trajectory optimization. So for robots that are making and breaking contact with the world, how do we design dynamic motions? How do we control those motions? Uh, in, in a way that's going to be algorithmically tractable. Uh, uh, and then a kind of more interesting question to me right now is how do we design control policies and can we, that we can design them and verify them that are going to be stable and effective through contact? So in a grasping scenario, in a locomotion scenario, can we find a control policy that will be provably effective in some very contact-rich environment? Okay? The answer is that we can for now. Uh, there's a lot of work still to be done here. And the kind of very high level idea is that it involves uh, tools from convex optimization, so semi definite programming, uh, control theory, particular denominator control theory, and you know, an understanding of dynamics and equations of motion and how uh, these three things uh, can be combined to generate tractable, uh, practical algorithms. So I've, I've raced through this quickly, and I have like a minute and a half left. Um, you know, just as a, at a philosophical level, I think it's really important that generating general purpose tools uh, to get a, uh, enable a deeper understanding of solutions. So I think most people in robotics have been involved at in some level or another in generating robot videos uh, and trying to get that uh, example working, that demo working. But I think at the end of the day, that's not enough. We need to, uh, to really kind of examine the, the deeper uh, kind of problems, more general purpose uh, problems, and, and find solutions. At the end of the day, you know, those robot videos rely on a lot of expert knowledge, a lot of expert tuning and, and non-tuning and trial and error. And uh, the idea behind autonomy really is to eliminate that, that requirement. Some of the tools that I'm uh, interested in using and we'll be, we'll be working on in my lab are these kind of mathematical tools from, uh, from control theory, from dynamics, and again, also optimization. That's kind of the backbone computational hammer uh, that we'll be using. And optimization can take a lot of different Different forms, you know, nonlinear optimization, convex, even machine learning is, is you know, is form of optimization. Um, we're going to be having have robots in the lab soon. So one town, one seventy B, uh, under renovation now, but there should be a walking robot sometime in the spring, hopefully, and, and uh, an integration platform as well. So I think that'll be really exciting. You should come check it out. Hopefully, I'll be learning. And I'll end for the Uh, 
All right. Um, so yeah, so sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. I'll be uh, handling a lot of the requests for grass seminars, uh, inviting speaker and so on. So any suggestions for inciting speakers, please uh, send my way. Uh, we sent out a request uh, for a speaker earlier this year uh, and I got some feedback, but uh, um, more is, uh, is gonna be helpful. So uh, suggestion of who you wanna see, uh, what topic you wanna see, please. Uh. So this fall I heard a lot of requests for deep learning. So we have uh, quite a few uh, speaker come in um, and uh, I know some people have strong feelings one way or another. So I, I think at least it's good to have a debate. Um, so I work on computer vision and Dan has showed uh, a few slides about my work earlier. Um, but I have sort of switched direction in the last few years, particularly focused on the direction of first person camera. Uh, when I was a little kid, I grew up watching a lot of movies and videos. Uh, so I enjoy uh, watching a lot of TV until I realized it's not good for me. Um, now I have kids and decided not to have a TV at home at all. So my kids are sort of deprived of TV experience and they, 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 they enjoy go to Best Buy and look at TVs. And, um, <laughs> and, um, but now I realize that all the stuff on the TV is kind of fake. Uh, and, and this is a video uh, I think Geddes showed me was uh, our Swing Swing Fund about a basketball game uh, it was filmed in Europe. I think it's a Turkish station who broadcasts a first person videos of the sports. Um, so I don't play basketball, but I imagine you know if you play basketball, this is the sort of experience you do uh, have. Uh, you can feel the contact, if you can feel the emotion. Uh, the videos are much more jittery and so on, but uh, I found this experience far more close to uh, something that we experience in our daily life. So this really come back to the question of what is a first person video and uh, why first person video is so different from a broadcast TV, uh, which we've been working on before. So it's been a, a few years working on this topic. Uh, and, and the only thing I understood so far is really first camera really tell about something about me. So it's really about egocentric and it's really about understand uh, what we're thinking, uh, what we're doing. The three topics that we're working on, I'll try to just kind of organize my work, is really about attention, prediction, and skill and control. So those are topics in robotics traditionally, but I realize this is actually the same issue that we confront when we look at the videos from the egocentric view. So attention to me really is what traditional topic in vision, which is called object recognition but object recognition tied to a component called a memory. So everything actually is gonna be memory based uh, and attention particularly is really memory based. Uh, so this is the work that my colleague Jim Rick done at Georgia Tech where he has recorded uh, his students, uh, and he asked students to wear these cameras and with the gaze tracking and then they're cooking and then you know they recorded the, the video plus the gaze tracking. The hotspots is exactly where the gates are. And we decided to do something different uh, in the sense that we want to figure out attention but without having gaze tracking. So uh, one of the insights is that your gaze is not always correlated with your attention. So you can certainly pay attention to something without looking at it, and you could have multiple attention in the field of view, or most of us actually have no attention whatsoever when we go through our life. <laughs> so uh, even you might be looking straight at something, you might not pay attention at all. So attention and gaze are different, and uh, we want to know that. Um, so we want to, given this kind of first person view, want to put this gaze attention. Some hint that this is possible, for example, you know, we know object had to be a certain distance away before we can touch it. Uh, if we know the category of the object, that we know how far, uh, how big it is in the picture, we can figure out the distance to us. Uh, if we order for us to look at something, we, we need to have certain distance angle to it. Um, so those are sort of geometrical cues. And we started experiments by wearing uh, a pair of GoPro. This is a Sandong uh, wearing a pair of GoPro with a big helmet on his head and recorded his daily life. Oh, done, okay. Okay, well if you want to hear more about the first person video, do come to see me, yes. Okay. Thank you, John Bro. Next up is Professor Cynthia Sun, another of our uh, one of the hires in mechanical engineering, and applied mechanics. Uh, Cindy,
Hi everyone, I'm Cynthia Sun. I'm with the Mechanical Engineering and Applied Mechanics Department. Basically my work is on computational design and origami robots. The big vision here is that we want to make robots more accessible to everyone. And so in the future you can imagine Alice and Bob maybe want a robot to help them with their house. They can take their idea of what they want this robot to look like and bring it to the Build-A-Box store down the street, input all of this information into a system, and the system will help them to automatically design a functional robot without them having to go through years of engineering training. And so they can very quickly bring this robot home and use it in their own lives. So the purpose of my research is to figure out how we can build this system because it doesn't actually exist yet. And we take a two-pronged approach to this. One is that we want to make the fabrication fast so that the robot hardware is accessible. And to do this, we target foldable robots. Foldable robots are basically robots that you can print as 2D sheets and fold into their 3D form. And this kind of origami-inspired engineering has been shown to be able to very rapidly produce low-cost structures with high strength to weight ratios. You see it in a lot of everyday objects. And we're hoping to take these advantages and also apply them to robotic hardware. Our other main thrust is that we want to make the design tools easy for people to use. So here you see an example that we developed to, in order to allow people to compose custom robots by compose, composing parts in a kind of virtual Lego set. So here, this system will keep track of all the kinematics and the geometric constraints, and it'll simulate the robot to help the person make sure that what they're going to design is functional and that it satisfies whatever metrics that they want it to satisfy so that they can go ahead and fabricate it using our folding technique. So if people are satisfied with, with whatever robot they've designed in the system, then our system will output a full fabrication plan, which people can follow. And in about 30 minutes, they'll have a robot that's printed, assembled, and that can walk around in their desk um, pretty quickly. So these, these are the main goals for the work that's going into my group. And the technical question that we're actually answering in order to achieve these kinds of systems are first, folding kinematics. This question is, how do we figure out what kind of robots we can actually achieve through folding? If you're interested in computational geometry, for example, um, this involves a lot of work in looking at how you can lay out folds, looking at how you can lay out fold patterns that fold into particular 3D shapes for that kind of move. It turns out we can actually achieve a lot of really interesting mechanisms this way, but the corresponding fold patterns are really complicated. And so people probably don't want to fold that. So, Another project that we're working on is how we can get these robots to assemble themselves. We work on interesting materials that you can design such that when you apply heat or you hit them with light, they'll fold into the shapes that you want the robot to form, and then you'll be able to deploy them without any kind of human intervention, making them really useful in remote deployment scenarios like space or medical applications. Another advantage of folding is that you can create really compliant structures. So we think this is an approach that we can use to um, enhance existing soft robots and make robots that are safe and that can interact with people. In order to do that, we analyze a lot of mechanics. So we develop mechanics models of folded structures and try to figure out how those can be scaled with the size of the robot and with the fabrication technique. So if that's something that you're interested in, one thing I do want to say is I'm actively recruiting in my lab. So you should come talk to me or email me at crsum at
right, fantastic. Okay, let's see if this actually plays. So, uh, as Dan said, my name is uh, CJ Taylor, and of course this is really just a good excuse for me to come up and show gratuitous robot videos. Um, these particular uh, videos are taken from, from our FLA project, which is uh, a project involving uh, a uh, gang of thousands, uh, a number of us faculty here, Professor Kumar, myself, uh, Dan, pretty, uh, Costas, uh, Jambo. Um, and the goal in this case is to develop um, fully autonomous uh, flying systems that are capable of um, navigating through the wor world com uh, without any assistance from human beings. So the goal here is that the, the system is given a uh, direction and bearing that it wants to go to, uh, and uh, that's it. The goal is to get to where you, to, you, were, you were told to go, uh, come back, and survive. Um, so on its way, the, uh, the, our hapless robot encounters lots of things that are trying to kill it, um, like trees, which are very mean, and then buildings, and then doors. Doors suck. Um, <laughs> and uh, it has to not only figure out where they are, uh, needs to uh, put them in an appropriate representation of what's going on, needs to automatically plan its way around them, needs to figure out when it's got to where it's going, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, th at this point the robot's very confused. It doesn't know where, it, it thought it was gonna go it in, but there was one of those nasty doors, and that's gonna go around to the back. So it's gonna keep on going, uh, going while in chat. Um, so I, I mentioned this to sort of uh, motivate some of the, the projects that we've been working on um, lately and tell you, tell you a little bit about them. Um, one thing this has sort of led, led us to do, uh, led me to be doing, is uh, considering how to embed this kind of level of in intelligence on um, real platforms that need to work around in a real world with real constraints on how much power, uh, how much computation you have available to, to them. So this, for instance, is a rendering of a new uh, system that we're standing up in collaboration for, with some folks at the Open Source Robotics Foundation, the same good people that brought you Ross. Um, we're building our own um, custom stereo system equipped with uh, TX2, uh, two cameras, uh, FPGA, uh, IMU, and our goal is we want all of the smarts for our robot to ultimately live on small, self-contained uh, systems like this so the robots can get uh, even smarter, uh, better, and the like. So here, for instance, is some, you know, uh, an example of uh, early stereo results we have implemented on uh, prototypes of this, of this system, where the system needs to be able to do, for instance, this task of depth, depth estimation in real time on the robot while flying around, not hitting things. Um, so as you can imagine, this sort of poses a whole raft of problems that we're going to be, uh, be, be generally interested in. Um, one is uh, how do we actually do these kinds of tasks like uh, real-time 3D estimation in real time on these limited platforms? What new approaches do we need to bring, bring, uh, bring to bear in order for this to happen uh, in a good way? Um, other kinds of problems we're interested in things like uh, fast image mosaicing and stitching that we've been doing some recent work with. Uh, we're, be, we're now at the point where we're able to, to collect volumes of information with these kinds of flying platforms that's relevant to agriculture, it's relevant to inspection, it's relevant to uh, accurate metrology of spaces. Um, how do we actually uh, make that happen uh, and, and develop algorithms that are sort of uh, both effective, efficient, and robust? Um, one of the thing that's sort of uh, 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 floating my boat because this has uh, interesting mathematical connotations is uh, developing novel optimization techniques. So we're looking at uh, uh, approaches to develop, develop uh, new stereo algorithms based on mixed integer programming, ways that uh, allow us to, to handle a lot of the, the interesting and important corner cases. Um, the other thing that we're, we're trend... <laughs> All right. Uh, let me just give one... Uh... <laughs> All right, I, um, my lab, we call it Mod Lab. I'm gonna show you basically a bunch of videos uh, of stuff that we are currently working on. Um, I, I've got more videos than we have time for, so I like crickets. Well, let's wait till we get to the crickets. Um, essentially, my lab focuses on building things, mostly novel uh, devices, so creative devices, although we also get involved a little bit on the, all the other aspects, the algorithmic sides of, of things and 
control and things like that. So um, I'm going to show you, uh, these are the list of some of the videos. We, we do uh, mobile vehicles, flying vehicles, modular reconfigurable robot systems, uh, arms, trusses, and uh, things like that. So this is actually a relatively old thing. This is a uh, holonomic vehicle. Um, my main message here is uh, a lot of people don't realize that you can have a holonomic vehicle with differential drive. They think you need these omniwheel things, um, and you don't. Uh, omniwheels are really expensive, and they don't work very well for going over gaps or anything like that. You can actually have a holonomic vehicle with a differential drive ahead of this, is, this concept is actually over a decade old, but the number of researchers that I, that I talk to that don't realize that is shocking to me, so I, I want to make sure that everyone here knows you can actually do holonomic vehicles with differential drives. Okay. Um, along the lines of holonomic, a lot of people are starting to think about holonomic flying vehicles. That is, uh, what people often call it fully actuated or omnidirectional. You can, uh, quad rotors, you know, have to do this type of thing. Uh, if you want to go left, you have to tilt left. You don't have six degrees of freedom. This vehicle actually has six degrees of freedom. It's uh, with two motors. It can actually tilt and you know translate opposite direction from its tilting. Um, it's got it's it has. It's not actually fully actuated because it only has two motors, but it does everything that a, a holonomic omnidirectional vehicle could do. I know you you, I, you probably couldn't tell it. It actually went six degrees one way and six degrees the other. The problem is that its range of motion isn't large, so that's it's a work in progress. We're we're, we're getting there. Um, uh, I think all of you know there's, a, or most of you, if you don't know, also uh, ICRA deadline is today, um, which is, what, 15 hours from now? So um, some of these things will be submitted there, and most of my students are working like crazy trying to get that done. Um, let's see. Uh, we have also the smallest flying vehicle in the world. Uh, so this is, done, this is also old. This was last year. Currently, we're trying to get it so that we can control better XYZ positioning of that uh, device, um, so that's that's what we're working on. Uh, this is some work with Vijay Kumar's group. We're having uh, so we do assembling system modular reconfigurable robots. So one of the things is, can we have flying robots that dock and reconfigure themselves in midair? Uh, and we can, um, at least docking. The undocking part we haven't done yet. Um, <laughs> the, the the other question is, why? Uh, why would you want to do this? And we're still working on that. <laughs> um, here's, we can also, another interesting idea of having things, if we can get these things to dock, uh, we could have a, a gripper. So this has one degree of freedom. That could be a fun thing to play around with. Uh, oh, so this is, um, i got to show you a different, different video. The um, modular... We have a uh, modular reconfigurable robot system. Hmm. Where did it go? Um, okay, well, it's not showing. Um, we have a modular reconfigurable robot system that looks like this. Uh, you got to be kidding. <laughs> Um, it can open drawers, uh, does everything autonomously, it's, uh, the video's really cool, um, and there's more stuff. Uh, let's see, we have, uh, uh, actually let me uh, have an annuated going, can we talk about the uh, RASP uh, outreach efforts? Uh, the annuated, uh, the is a uh, staff member in the uh, draft club and also uh, in the uh, Graduate School of Education. So if you are interested in education as well as average, you should certainly call him for both reasons. I've been watching everyone struggle and hoping that I wouldn't have the same problem, and I did. There we go. Okay. Um, so my name is Dan Miller Uida. Uh It's a new name for me, so I'm adjusting to it. Uh, so I run the outreach programs here. So I want to go over what happens here, and there's a lot that happens. The uh, 
90 PhD students and 122 master's students get involved in a lot of different things. So I, I want to talk about those. Um, and there's a lot of reasons, a lot, a lot of purposes of this work, um, but I have limited time, so I want to focus on what we do. So first, uh, we run a number of summer programs um, or are involved with a number of summer programs. The SMP program has um, 18 high school students from public schools in Philadelphia per summer. Uh, girls in Engineering, Math, and Science, or GEMS, is um, middle school girls students. Um, Stepping Stone Academy is an, it's an external program that we work with. Uh, S, the Stepping Stone and SMP are four-week programs. Girls, the GEMS program is one week. And ESAP is a program that Mark Yim has been working on. And uh, that is a three-week program for high school students. Um, we do a lot of outreach events, uh, big events like the Philly Robotics Expo, lots and lots and lots of demos. We have about 1,400 students per year that come through our labs. Um, we had an event this past summer at the Penovation Center called Be a Penovator. Uh, we've gone out to the DARPA Robotics Challenge to do demonstrations. We've gone to the engineering and Science Festival in Washington, D.C., which is the largest STEM outreach event in the country. Um, so we do a lot of different events every year. Uh, we are also, I don't know if anyone's ever been involved with FIRST Robotics, but we are the partner, official partner for FIRST LEGO League and Junior FIRST LEGO League in Southeast Pennsylvania. And there are about 200 teams, 200, 220 teams of middle school students that compete every year. We have a championship here at Penn on February 10th. Um, and we do a lot of different things with that program. Um, I work with uh, Professor Kotacek um, on the Research Experience for Teachers program, which is an NSF-funded site for middle school teachers to do research in the field of robotics for six weeks in a very stressful, intense program. Uh, they work side by side with a doctoral or postdoc student. Um, and undergrads <laughs> and master students. They work with a lot of different people. Um, and then they work on developing curriculum to bring back to their classrooms. Um, we're also working on a lot of different engineering education initiatives. Uh, so one, Toby is a robot that has had a multitude of people who have worked on it, but it started with Gavin Keneally. I believe it started with him. Um, uh, it's a robot for classroom purpose, for an education purpose, and we're working on developing curriculum with that. The um, computational thinking course, many of you don't know about this, but we are in collaborating with GSE to develop a computational thinking course for in-service teachers. Um, it, it introduces introduces machine learning, natural language processing, computer vision, and uses um, Python Raspberry Pi to teach those things. I'm working with two master students, um, Ovi and Vivek, uh, in that development. And we're also working on a redevelopment of the STEM education, or development of a STEM education master's program at GSE. So a lot of collaboration with GSE. So why do we do all these things? Uh, First of all, the, the university has a, what's called the Penn Compact. Um, inclusion, innovation, and impact is a major uh, push or focus of the university. Um, Penn Engineering has objectives about the types of students that we want to produce that come out of the school. Um, engineering is an agent for social and economic progress. So these are all reasons why we do it. But also a lot of our funding, a lot of your funding comes from NSF. And 50% of the NSF requirement is broader impact. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can help out as well. And I'll be sending out emails to all of you soon. <laughs> Thanks.